all for, right, all I wanted to do was sing the theme song to I can't even think of the show. It's oh, just that it one that's like This is a good opening bit. I know <laughs> you see somehow the world will change for me and feel so wonderful. Is it wonderful? It's I Carly. It's I oh, Carly. You got there. <laughs> Were you ever part of the iCarly viewing parties at my house? No, no. See, I didn't get into iCarly. I was I was too old for it to be into it unironically and too cool to be into it ironically. So, I don't know. I, mean, I was, was just into it. it. I, I'm, and I'm not ashamed. <clears throat> the first episode I saw of iCarly was season two, episode 10, I Kiss, where Freddy and Sam admit that they've never kissed anyone yet. And they've been like know. enemies up to this point. I don't know if we've ever had this conversation on the show before, and I don't I don't even really care whether or not we have. I just hope we have. <laughs> because it would just be this is this is a phenomenal thing that like I am getting deja vu about. Like everything about your your you remembering the first episode you ever saw, you and your sister, like, I don't know, like didn't you like bunk school one day to, to watch iCarly or some nonsense like that? Uh, um, well it was we all bunked to school college. Well the real reason why you never watched iCarly with us is that um, I, I wish I had time to think of a clever... Um, the Curtain Overlord uh, mm. was was often part of that. <laughs> and when it comes to treating your life like Star Wars, you would be the Jedi and he would be the Sith. <laughs> um, mostly because... And I don't, I'm just... What the hell? I'm just talking at this point, right? Um, you never, like really hated him like he just existed uh-huh <laughs> um but he the minute he met you hated you seems to come up a lot with a lot of uh, a lot of people on your yeah, side of the fence <laughs> a, you know what the big thing is there's a reason why you and i are friends <laughs> and that's like the real thing is that like you you're you're kind of this weird litmus test georgie um <laughs> where Great. uh where if I'm hanging out with somebody and then they're like, I fucking hate that guy. I would be like, yeah, so I got to rethink this friendship, huh? Because <laughs> uh, he's kind of the best. <laughs> if you have a problem with him after, uh, don't do that. Don't awe. I do a podcast with you, which we have not really introduced. <laughs> we haven't even started yet. Uh, no, uh, we're definitely recording. Um, so, yeah, welcome to the Say Report. Uh, I Carly, it just it just jumped into my head that stupid song. Uh, I am Devin Decker, and joining me, the guy who I think it's it's too hard to hate, Sejan Sarawak. Hey man, I was all ready to come in here all all with an angry <laughs> bit to start off, and about how pissed off I am that somebody beat me to the punch on a Soul Caliber character. Um, I, man, <laughs> every Soul Caliber character has been done. Oh my god, and it's officially done because I was playing. I don't have that. Uh, I don't have six is the one that just came out, right? Yes. Make sure I'm saying this right. <laughs> um, I don't have six yet. So, uh, but what I did do is I recently invested in four and five for the PS3, which we're now playing on the on the 4K TV, and it's like some of the best looking stuff we've got game wise. Um, and so I was sitting around playing with the character creator last night, and I had created as close as I could in the moment. A really fantastic Sonic. Thank you very much. He happens to be wearing a lot of chainmail, but I think that's the only way that you can make Sonic cool. So it's like Sonic <laughs> and the Black Knight. Yeah, there you Sonic. go. Sonic. Yeah. All right, so I have to ask, because immediately things jumped into my head, for mm -hmm. the style, the character mm -hmm. style, Talim? No. Um, uh, Hide is that how you say his name? Hideyu? The guy that's based on Monkey there. He's got the big staff. That he like oh 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 with. motherfuck so I have I, I, so yeah. I need to here's what here Devin Decker just completed a side quest yesterday, mm -hmm. and we're gonna get to that side quest. Um, that that's been active in my on my, my list of like quests for two years almost. Yeah, and I completed it yesterday. Very proud of myself. Um, but another side quest that I should probably complete is getting back my copy of Soul Calibur Five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah man. because i bought soul caliber 5 and i played it the day that i bought it and then i didn't play it anymore and then two years ago three years ago at this point because we're nearing the second year anniversary of the say report which blows my mind <laughs> yeah. um three years ago I had brought it over to play at a friend's house, and we don't talk really anymore. Uh, and um, okay. we played Mortal Kombat 9, my Lost copy of divorce, which man. is also there. Oh, God. And so, like, I need to get those games back. Yeah, That's man. what I need to do. 
Well, especially five. Like five is is gorgeous. I mean, for you know, for being a game now that is what eight years old now or something like that or six. Probably, yeah. I think it was six years between five and this. Yeah, um, like five is um, five is just real pretty, and like the robust character creation stuff, and you get to do all sorts of silly stuff with like the stances and the and the, and the editing the images. Full online play. There's still people playing it. Not as many as obviously you would like for a fighting game, but the fact that like a game that is that old still has a pretty active audience is pretty cool, especially with the sequel having just come out. Well, especially um, since uh, Soul Calibur Five also sort of undone by the sequel. Like, I don't know. Like, that's always weird when they go to, like, the future for a game. Yeah, yeah, Like, I'm yeah. curious what Mortal Kombat 11 is going to look like. Yeah, Because I, guess, I really love... With the soul, well, the thing for me with the Soul Calibur story, like, the, the Mortal Kombat story, I would not have said this 10 years ago, but the Mortal Kombat story has really pulled itself together into a really fantastic, like, narrative. So you're right. It'll be really interesting to see what they do with with characters and, and worlds and all that sort of stuff. Soul Calibur has always been batshit fucking insane in every aspect. Stories have never quite made sense. Spoken been... like someone who has only ever played Soul Calibur at a friend's house. Oh, no, no. Not, played, not the person I who... Say, I haven't played all of them. I have played two, and now I have played four and five. Four a lot more than five. I So two and four are really, like, my go-tos for understanding what could possibly be a story and like i get it i see the narrative that is there but you cannot tell me that it is not some like you know what it is can i tell you the really fucked up shit shit. the really (laughs) fucked up thing is all of the story exists in soul caliber and soul caliber 3 and not (laughs) soul caliber 6 like it's really kind of got star trek syndrome uh, oh, no. Where like the the even ones are are the good ones because it doesn't really give a damn about story. It's just like fun with weapons. Yeah, uh, right. season eight of South Park, fun with weapons. It's uh, <laughs> that's such a nice. good episode of South Park. But like that's really what those are. Like, like Darth Vader's here, and don't worry about why Darth Vader's here. There is a reason why Darth Vader's here, but don't worry about it. Like <laughs> like just enjoy that you're playing as Darth Vader. Like, yeah, exactly. Where like. Number three specifically, and it pisses me off that I lost my copy of three because three is the one that I've played the second most. And that's including full clears every character on all three systems Soul Calibur 2 came out on. Three would Sunday nights, we would just come here after we got off our, of work and play Soul Calibur 3 till like four in the morning. And it was Jeez. glorious. And the reason why is you have that character Edge Master. <laughs> yeah, I don't know yeah. if he exists in four or five because I, I don't remember them. Four, uh, I bought a PlayStation Three specifically so I could have Soul Calibur Four, and then I put Soul Calibur Four into the box for the PlayStation Three to move it, oh. and forgot. <laughs> And I just recently found my copy of Soul Calibur 4. So nice. I'd love to go back and, like, rock through that once I finish 6. But 3, um, the Soul, the Edge Master character is a bird-headed man named Alkin. Mm-hmm. And he is fantastic. And what we would do is we would just, both got people would pick Alkin, because you could rematch, and it was faster load times. <laughs> so everything, you'd have a sep- you'd have a different weapon. So, like, it just made it more fun that way. Like, yeah. it was, like, a fast random feature. Nice. And that, oh, we played so much. But also, in playing Soul Calibur 3, in order to unlock Alkin, I had to do basically the mission mode of, of 6. And there's so much story on display in 3. And it really, like, ties together all the stuff that was really established in the first Soul Calibur and then largely ignored in Soul Calibur 2. So it is super funny to me that you have spent time with the games that are like, story doesn't matter in these games. And then like a different person sits down in the game design chair and they're like, I feel like there's some people out here who play these games for the story. So... (laughs) Yeah, well, get your shit together, so Calibur. Um, (laughs) Oh, it's together. They're great. um, I, I, so it's just, I'm sorry, because I've actually, I'm trying to think of the most Soul Calibur I've ever played, and I think now, because somebody recently showed me this, the most Soul Calibur I think I've ever personally, like, partaken in is Dancing Valdo videos online. Um, <laughs> it was recently shown to I me don't know if that whole counts. genre of YouTube <laughs> where there are people, people choreograph 
they take two Valdos, right, and they match themselves up against, and then they've choreographed entire fight sequences with the both of them into amazing dances. I well, we watched one the other night the, that was shown to me that was uh, all too smooth criminal. Um, you know, like the entire thing is just it is so good, and now I have watched so many of them that I'm just like I, that, that's what I think of now whenever I think of Soul Calibur. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I have to say. This is me taking the moment to say I love you because the dancing Valdo videos yeah. But yeah, is I, your experience I, I, with Soul Calibur. Well, and building Sonic the other night. I built. I spent <laughs> some time building Sonic. But then, yeah, woke up this morning to fucking the internet. Like, the internet ruins everything. Some guy made a better Sonic than me, and he made it in Soul Calibur 6. So of course, then, of course easy. he made a better Sonic than you. What, what style did he use for his Sonic? I don't know about the style. I feel like Callum is the best um, one for it. I gotta say, I think he used a female character because the whole joke of the whole like thread is how he's like posing, like Sonic posing and all of these like you know how we were talking the other day about Soul Calibur having a weirdly like a weird sense of like feminine versus masculine like move sets. Yeah, I think they used a female character of some kind. Yeah. So I I I I, I, I like have to believe it's Talim because the second you're like I made a Sonic, I'm like oof, I were making a Sonic, I would use Talim. Because her, she is a little Tomfus. You, I'm yeah. sure you know who Talon is. I don't know why I've explained it to you. It's for the audience, right? Because I have to imagine there's an audience, even though this has been the most inside jokey, rambling 12 minutes of this show to this point. <laughs> Which says something, but actually, when it comes to the Soul Calibur thing, I think there's a couple of people in our audience for sure I know of that actually probably know a lot more than at least me. <laughs> but like, I'm like, yeah, because Talon, because she does a lot of the running across the stage. Yeah, I'm looking up the, cute the Sonic punch. right now. That's what I'm doing. Okay, cute yeah, Sonic. look up cute Sonic while I, yeah, yeah. So Talon would be who I would use. Plus, you could color the weapons white so it would just look like his his gloves. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Um, what is Sonic, Sonic the Hedgehog Sonic? character creation? I'm trying to see exactly what they use. Hold on. All right, so I can. I guess I can vamp a little bit. Uh, so <laughs> I, I mentioned that I completed. Fuck this. you! I'm keeping my ad blocker on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in the realm of other video games, um, I did platinum. Castlevania Requiem, which was the collection of Castlevania Symphony of the Night and Castlevania R Rondo of Blood. Yeah, yeah. And playing Rondo of Blood, like, in the original Turbo Graphic style, not the Dracula X Chronicles version that we got for the PSP, it's so nice. Like, I understand <laughs> why the creator and, like, like chairman of what Castlevania is at Konami, at least at the time, felt like Rondo of Blood was this turning point for that series. Because yeah. there are people who are going to have a difficult time with the game, right? I'm talking to one right now. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> but, like, for someone like me who has muscled his way through Castlevania and Castlevania Three: Dracula's Curse, coming to that game and, like, having fluidity of motion and having, like, actual control over a Belmont... Is, mm -hmm. is a completely different game experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's awesome. Like, that game was excellent. And I completely finished all the trophies for that on Halloween. That was how I celebrated Halloween, was playing through Rondo of Blood. And then Saturday, I spent eight hours doing the remaining Symphony of the Night stuff, which <laughs> was mostly clearing the map. And I knew it would be the hardest thing for me to do. Because I've I've learned how to speedrun that game. Not to any level of anyone else on the internet. I do not backdash everywhere because that's fucking boring. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And I do it my own way. But, like, I know how to get through that game hitting, like, the minimum amount of rooms. Yeah, it's that really nice sweet spot when you're, when you're running a game that you know how to play. And it, you're not doing it to make a time you're not doing it for any it's just the nice flow that the game finally has like if if i go too slow when i'm playing a game i get bored really quickly you know if it's a game that i've played a thousand times that's why something like meat boy is fantastic for me because i love just jumping in and just killing 20 minutes clearing the first level of the first world of that game you know and like just flowing into it is fantastic and i can easily see how a castlevania game can feel like that yeah exactly exactly um, so, so uh, who did I got, cute I got one Sonic for you. use? Cute Sonic uh, used Tira because it gave him a gold ring to dance around with. Have I complained about Tira on the show? <laughs> I have. I, I, I know that I have. Yeah. yeah. 
So first yeah. of all, kudos to the creator of Cute Sonic. <laughs> yeah. Do we have a name? Let's let's give this guy a shout uh, out. Yeah. Um <laughs> Cute Sonic was created by Create a Soul. Create, uh, create. Um, <laughs> it's I think it's a I think Create a Soul is a is a group that does like weird online creation stuff. Uh, well, so they've got a Twitter handle that's Create a Soul. Shout out from at the Save Report to at Create a Soul. And if you heard this, you know, send them props for Cute Sonic. Mm -hmm. I just have a problem with the fact that Tira was not extra content. She was carved out content. <laughs> and, and no more evident than the fact that I have fought her in the game, but I have not downloaded her for money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we talked. We did, we did get into yeah. this last week. But, uh, but, uh, but, yeah. but kudos. That is another, that's another one that I would think of. And, like, my mind doesn't even go to her because... Of the fact that she's DLC. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, um, man. Um, but I'm going to build a Talon. Screw it. That'll be fun. Just, uh, you know what? I'll make it Knuckles. I'll make cute Knuckles <laughs> somehow. Fantastic. Why not? <sighs> so so we, uh, we should probably touch a little bit on some stuff this week since tomorrow is the big day for voting, right? Yes. Like, should we talk about that? We should talk about it. I that. guess, yeah, we should talk about election day. Um, <laughs> great. It's, it's I'm hard. so happy that you did this. No. Um, no, man. <laughs> I got into the election day spirit today by mm -hmm. voting for who I thought should win around the horn because <laughs> this is going to be my transition into it. Uh, they launched their new, like, augmented reality. They changed sets that they're now filming in New York instead of Washington. And okay. they, they've completely revamped the look of the show and made it even more, like, technologically advanced. Are we assuming everybody understands what Around the Horn is? Oh. I only have a passing understanding. Okay, of so this. I was assuming that. <laughs> Around the Horn, um, it was one of the most technically ambitious shows ever when it premiered back in 2003. Which, like, I can't believe I've been watching Around the Horn for 15 years. <laughs> They've done, like, over 3,000 episodes of this show. Because they, they do an episode every, every day. Which is crazy when you think, like, there's enough sports that happens every weekday <laughs> for them to talk about it for half an hour. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> like, the, really. Um, and what it is, is, and why it was ambitious, is it is live streams of four... Um, prominent members of sports news media um, being recorded and then all of that is shared um, on a fifth stream that takes place in the studio. So it's like really cool because all these people are like talking live and they're having this conversation mm -hmm. and like in real time and then you have the host who's scoring them and I actually rewatched the first episode because they put it up online to like talk about how this is the 15th year and they're finally changing and just to see what has changed from that first episode to now is awesome like your points everybody used to get facetime at the end your points was just how many seconds of facetime you would have mm -hmm. where now your points get you into a showdown and then whoever wins that gets 30 seconds of facetime <laughs> but so what it is so so it's this really like technically ambitious show where all of these uh, sports reporters, but it's not the sports reporters. But it's the reason why sports reporters doesn't exist anymore because it's right. basically the show the sports reporters cut down into half an hour like and delivered faster. And like there's graphics and like ooh it's fun. <laughs> yeah yeah. And there's uh, scoring yeah. like John Saunders wasn't scoring Mike Lupica on what he had to say. <laughs> Every week, Mike Lupico was just given like a quarter of the sports reporters to talk. <laughs> uh, so they've updated the whole thing. And one of the things that came along with the update is, for all intents and purposes, a meaningless uh, score along at home system. Because there's <laughs> no way the score I'm given is, is points being given to these people on the screen. Right. Even though there were some times where I'd hit it and then their score would go right up. So, like, there are people, and I'm not being rude, right? But it's just, like, one of those things. It's a gimmick. They, they introduced this gimmick to the show. Yeah, but it's a grandma gimmick. It's it, called that because you, your grandmother buys it thinking it's this great, amazing thing. And you know instantly what a stupid thing it is, but you just say, thanks, grandma. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I scored along today, and it was yeah. fun to do that. I'm never going to do it again. I might <laughs> score along if I'm at, like, a bar and it's on. Like, yeah, just yeah. for the shits and giggles of it. But, like... <laughs> 
it was it was interesting. But then, like I say, that there's no taking it. But like Mina Kimes, her score went up so much faster than than Tony Reale, the host, would ever give people points. So I don't know, <laughs> honestly, how well, much effect the online component has. I it, it's say, none. The answer is it, none. I have to believe it's none, or I my mean, brain it, breaks. It, or it could be the answer could be somewhere in between. It could be just a very extremely small percentage that just happens to every now and then rear its ugly head. You know, like other than that, like it, you don't really notice it too often. But I could under, I could see it being a, a small percentage of what's happening on screen. That'd be cool. I don't know. It's it, it's fun. It was fun to compete along with that. But, you know, it's an interesting thing that they do that right before Election Day 2018. And, <laughs> yes, from everyone at the Say Report, go vote. I feel like my vote will do nothing. And that is a, the truest statement I may have ever said on this show. A yeah. lot of firsts in this episode. I think a lot of people feel that way in the world, uh, in, the, in the country, in the, well, in the world. Well, yeah, see, <laughs> people you, say vote that, places. you say that, but... <sighs> I just don't see how Rhode Island can affect it. And this mm -hmm. is like a, this is a relatively new thing where like with the 2016 election, everybody was so upset that Donald Trump won. Rightfully so, right? Like I I I don't think you'll have any problem saying that this show is not pro Trump. Right? No, I don't I, I don't think this I don't think it's a surprise to any of our listeners. I don't think it's offensive. Oh, yeah, anyway, keep going. Wait, we, we we're not Trumpers. <laughs> Not to nope. toot our own horns, but, um, so it was this weird thing. Like I watched a 60 year old man like weeping and not knowing how to go on with his life because Trump won. Right. So I thought about it and I thought about the fact that we're in Rhode Island and I, I looked at how many delegates this state gets in terms of like a state, like a swing state, one of these swing states that people try to get, or like even California, right? Because they're, like, California, because we're both really blue states, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, you always have a blue Christmas in Rhode Island. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. God, that's a very Newport thing of you to oh, say. Yeah, that's uh -huh. why I said it. Thanks, CG. <laughs> uh, but, um, and I, I looked at, like, what my vote as a Rhode Islander actually means against a vote from one of these like states that has more delegates and has more people in the electoral college. And my vote, the easiest way to represent what percentage my vote has as an effect on this country is 0%. Because it's that many decimal places. It's yeah. four decimal places before there's a digit besides zero. <laughs> um, and that's just, and you know, I was working for a math department at the time. So like statistics and stuff, I, like, I did, I did a lot of work to that. And I'm like, wow, it's kind of hard to look at my vote and think it means something, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but these are like local elections, right? So, you know, think globally, act locally. These are the ones that matter. These are the elections that really matter. And if you want to affect change, we need to start on a local level to, to go forward from there, right? right? So even though I am super disenfranchised with vo voting means, even though I jeopardized my job um, when my boss came down on another secretary at the school saying, you don't get, you don't get to say anything because you didn't vote. That's why Trump won trying to hang the whole thing on her not voting, right? Right. But she lives in Rhode Island. So <laughs> even if she had voted for Trump, it yeah. does not affect him winning yeah. because the state of Rhode Island voted for Hillary in hey, the Electoral so College. Yeah. So, like, I do mean, not hang your head. Do not hang all of the responsibility on the one person who said, I don't, I don't, it's not worth my time to go vote. Like you, it's, it's such a ridiculous thing, especially when you then consider Hillary Clinton won the electoral college. I'm not, the, yeah. not, not that the popular vote. She won the popular vote. <laughs> right. Other way around. So she like, won the popular yeah, vote and lost. She the lost the electoral vote. college. And like the whole reason that this shit exists is so that they can control and they can reach back from the shadow government and put into power who they want to be there. This is the, mm -hmm. the God, again, a lot of first. This is the most conspiracy theory you'll hear from me. <laughs> yeah, like, I, was waiting, I was waiting to hear how, how we were going to maybe be able to connect this to mine because I, it's, everything's always connected. Everything is connected. Like, Sejin is this crazy conspiracy theorist. Right? Like, I come up with, like, fun ones that, like, Freddie Mercury was a tool for, like, Nazis to try to impart power. 
<laughs> like that, that was <laughs> oh that good old boy yeah that that a fun one yeah. well you know we well, you want to talk about it right Jaws was never his scene and he doesn't like Star Wars and those are made by two <laughs> prolific Jewish film directors see oh now I thought you were gonna say the whole Star Wars thing was actually a reference to the whole Star Wars project created by Reagan which I would have to say I would actually f- add fuel to that fire. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. There's even more, <laughs> Sujin, right? Like, like this is like something I come up with in fun. But like, it's hard to look at the Electoral College and say, yeah, this is for me. This is for this country and for the the rights of every man. It's not. It legitimately limits your rights, especially when the people who win the Electoral College do not win the popular vote. And that's been it happening a bunch. A, it was a fantastic plan. 200 years ago when people had a hard time getting to Washington, D.C. to make their voices heard, creating an electoral college so that way their voices could be heard made a lot of sense. We no longer live like that, which I think could be said about a lot of things that we do in this country. That's just true. Because this country to. needs to get a fucking kick in the ass yeah. and reboot itself like like my fucking iPhone does. Like my iPhone in the last six months has had two full iOS updates. The country needs to like sort of reboot itself I mean, and, and, like, and, and put in some like some things that make sense for the modern world. And I'm just very surprised you don't hear more of this exact kind of idea from from more business minded Republicans because – Oh, every year businesses reinvent themselves. Like you just pointed out with like Apple, right? I mean, like every year, the whole idea is a company needs to re- reinvent itself to stay fresh and new and, and like understanding of the world. Why can we not say the same about us? You know, like, I had fun things I wanted to talk about this week, but you, yeah. you've you opened up this can and I'm going to say the reason why businesses reinvent themselves and suddenly make themselves flashier, right, is to distract us from how fucking broken our system of government is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, man. They don't want – uh, and, and the people who are in power, the people who are responsible for these rebrands and these re-ups, they don't want to touch it. Because of the way that it's set up, how archaic it is, they're able to live like fucking kings. This is like I, I rubbed a magic lamp and a magic conspiracy genie just came it's right. Not, that's not even you. that's not even conspiracy, man. That's just the truth. <laughs> it's just the truth. Like it, it, oh. it's just it's this way. Like uh. like we we live based on like old archaic systems and means that like do not that are not relevant to the modern world. Fair enough. You were giving me a really good segue, but I don't want to cut off any of your uh, your, your no, rants. The, the, the important thing is that even though I feel like the people who I vote for tomorrow aren't really going to have an effect because I don't see tomorrow's election giving us um, a Republican governor in Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. I don't see there being a lot of change across the board. Right. I'm still going to vote tomorrow. Because one of the best things about living in America is the fact that I do have a voice and I have a chance to make it heard. Yeah, man. And, like, let's all not forget that there was a lot of regret from people who didn't vote in the last election because they just didn't think Trump could possibly win. (laughs) That was definitely a thing that was out there. Trump didn't win. (laughs) <laughs> and that's where the rigging and the problem comes from. It's true enough. Like that's but... like and that's and that's the hard thing for me. But like there are people legitimately in states, right? Like everybody has been crowing that millennials for the first time outrank the baby boomers, right? Mm-hmm. The uh, the numbers of millennials are are now higher than the number of baby boomers who can vote. Right. So that right. means something. And that should mean something because there are a lot of states where that could affect things. I don't know anything about the governor of Connecticut. I don't. I don't know anything about him. I know his name because when I drive into Connecticut, it says, welcome to Connecticut, Governor Daniel P. Malloy. Mm-hmm. My experience with Daniel P. Malloy is calling him January 4th, 2011 to complain about Connecticut's new state motto, you never know what's going to happen. And somehow getting him on a phone. (laughs) (laughs) But that, January 4th, 2011, that was seven years ago. And Daniel P. Malloy has been the governor of Connecticut that entire time. 
The whole system's rigged, man. So, but I, but again, I don't know change. anything about him. I don't know anything about his politics. I don't know if he's a Republican or a Democrat. I also don't live in Connecticut, so you know it doesn't affect me as grand as if as if I did, right? Like mm-hmm. I know about the two candidates, the, well, the three candidates who are running in Rhode Island, and I know that I don't know who I want to vote for because you know, turd sandwich or giant douchebag. Exactly. Or guy who legitimately said, "I'm only running because it will dilute the vote," <laughs> like, like that. <laughs> oh man, like, it's, I miss it's, Rhode Island. It's just, I'm sorry. It's it's just one of these things. But like, you think about a thing like Daniel P. Malloy, and again, I don't know what he's done. I don't know if he's a good guy. I don't know if he's a bad guy. I just know that he has been governor for at least seven years. He has been the governor of Connecticut for at least seven years. And and if he is fucking corrupt, and, and that's a big if. Again, I don't know. I don't. I, I, I'm not saying anything ill about this, this gentleman. But if he were a corrupt governor, that's seven years that he has been in office being a corrupt governor. <laughs> So like, and if that's happening, Becky and way of putting it, but sure, yeah. But, well, it is, and then if that's just happening in my own backyard, right? If 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 you have other governors who've been in power for that same amount of time, that that's the same thing. And like, you need to enact a change. You have these senators who have just been doing it, sitting there because nobody's challenged them, and you need to challenge. I mean, God damn. I have a friend who lives in North Carolina and she was talking about, I don't, I'm getting ready to vote. And I'm like, I don't feel like I can do that because my votes, it just doesn't feel like it means as much as someone who lives in North fucking Carolina. You got to pack up all your crap and you got to move out to a state like Ohio or Utah. One of them like big states that, that doesn't agree with you then. I'm hoping to God that my vote counts tomorrow. The thing is, if I can even vote, I'm still having a hard time figuring out if I'm even registered yet. Yeah, with well, a name like Siegen, yeah, it well, has that's to a... be denied. <laughs> um, whole, whole other issue in my life. But um, but no, man, like signed up, definitely signed up to be registered to vote about uh, two weeks ago. Um, definitely checked the online registration and it's still not showing up. So, I mean... I don't know what to do. <laughs> Essentially, uh, you go like... out tomorrow, and that's what mm-hmm. you do. And yeah. and don't get into fights with people, right? Like yeah. there are these people. Like if somebody, <laughs> all right, I'm talking about something else too, right? Punching Nazis, right? <laughs> On paper, that seems like the right thing to do. <laughs> it kind of seems like it's common sense. It, but yeah. it seems like this thing, right? But if you are the first... This goes back to fucking grade school. (laughs) The person who throws the first punch is the person who gets in trouble. It is why the fucking justice system has self-defense as a reason why you can do things and not be held accountable under the law. Yeah. So, you know, be smart. Wait until they throw the first punch. Then swing away, Maris. Like, thank you. For Roger Maris reference, huh? A lot of sports and politics this week on the Say Report. If you've gotten this far, thank you. Seriously, thank you for continuing to listen. Um, but also, these are things that we shouldn't be afraid to talk about. This is a show about everything. And that is why I, I have no problem giving my all to this when all I wanted to talk about was fucking Comic Con. But. <laughs> but but really no, for sure please like, go uh, out and you, vote there are going yeah. to be people outside and they're going to try to like sway like change your mind and there are going to be people who are saying stupid things there are always people in this world who are saying stupid things there is someone out there right now who is pointing at their fucking ipod and saying you're a person who's saying a stupid thing Devin decker because that's how this world is exists and the beauty thing is that in america we get to say stupid things and not get killed for it most of the time (laughs) there's 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 always an exception to every rule right but we do (laughs) have freedom of speech in this country right so go out and use it because even if you feel like it is an uphill battle that you are fighting you cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel if you don't vote you are you are wasting the greatest gift you have as an American because there are countries where people don't get this. 
Yeah. There are countries that, that like do not shut down for hours so that people can go voice what they think needs to be done for their country. Or there are countries that do, quote unquote, have the vote that the vote is even more meaningless there than it is here. You think that our votes are meaningless and you talk about how the system is so stagnant here. At least that's the problem is just that it's stagnant. We can't get anybody to retire. It's not like we have some guy out there that's just killing his opponent in order to win, which is definitely a real big problem right now with some of these other countries trying to adopt democracy for the first time is trying to keep, you know, trying to <laughs> trying to play civil. <laughs> trying you know, to, yeah, try to play civil. That's true. This, He's is not wrong. This is the this is the, our system may not be perfect, but it is definitely the most civil system of of government overthrow <laughs> that there is in the world right now. So, like, let's get out there and, and do what we got to do, guys. Our and country I just want to say based Based on that, it is yes. built on overthrowing a corrupt government. One of the um, one of the big uh, one of the big things that I'd learned about this year that I didn't realize was a thing that happened, and I feel like an idiot for not realizing this was going on. But um, people being convinced to not go out and vote because they're receiving things like Facebook ads or even emails and things like that from all sorts of places. But the reason I know about this is actually all the Russian troll investigations. It's like people uh, messages informing them that they don't need to go out and vote that, that there's for some reason their vote is not necessary. And it could be something as mundane as like you live in this area that is safe and like, you know, like you don't need to go out and change anything about it. So don't worry, don't go out tomorrow. And it looks like it might even be from like the candidate being like, don't worry about coming out to vote for me tomorrow. Like I I'm going to win this thing no matter what. And then like people don't. And like, that is something that is actually legitimately going on right now as their their uh, Facebook went through and, and did their whole purging over the last couple of weeks of all of this political stuff that's been going on and more and more of these social media companies are dealing with the fact that like there's some stuff going around that is super shady and gross so if you've got any reason any reason at all that you're not going to go out and vote think about it for a second and make sure that it is one from within yourself because like Devin I don't like if your choice is that you don't want to do this because it's just something that you personally after everything that you've done decide you don't need to do that's one thing but if you're not going out to vote because you saw on facebook some relative that you don't quite remember telling you that there's no reason to go then maybe you might want to rethink that dude the second someone tells me not to do something i'm gonna start what questioning why yeah. and i'm gonna <laughs> do my investigation that's that, to me that's the worst way to dissuade people <laughs> and the fact that it's working a isn't very surprising. Well, but I, B, I don't know how much we can measure how much it actually works, true. but it is definitely something that people are trying, and there and and it's hard to ignore that there are there are specific groups of people in this country that don't vote all the time, and it's really hard to ignore that that really lines up with a lot of these things like social media groups, or you know older people that have Facebook and don't understand that everybody that contacts them isn't doing it out of the kindness of their heart, you know? Um, but yeah, you know, so just make sure you get out there and make sure that people you know are getting out there too tomorrow. Yeah. Um, let's do this, man. Let's switch over to Comic-Con because let's, uh, let's do some fun stuff. Jesus. What, what was your segue? What were you going to segue into that? Well, <laughs> we were talking about uh, old oppressive systems that we felt needed to be overturned and, and weird things that are done about them and, and all that sort of good stuff. And I, I wanted to know if you actually uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the MPAA and the PG-13 Deadpool edit. Cool. So <laughs> I'm going to see the PG-13 Deadpool edit. Me too. I, I'm going to see it. Um, mostly because they're doing it like the Princess Bride. Uh -huh. And the Princess Bride. What? Did you say <laughs> huh or uh-huh? <laughs> I said, I said, uh huh, because yeah. Uh, that, is, yeah. Uh, Ryan Reynolds said that he had two. Um, <laughs> he's basically he said there's two conditions if we ever do a PG-13 version of this movie, and he and one of those was that he got to take Fred Savage and do this whole like <laughs> Princess Bride style version of it. But the other side of that is also that he said portions of the, whatever proceeds you make off of it must go to a charity of some kind. So they're all going to uh, to fuck cancer, um, is which is a fantastic charity and uh, uh and so proceeds seeds for the, for the movie are going to that and it, yeah they also reshot like a, a framing device for the edited version of the movie which works for me on so many levels uh -huh. um a because have you ever read the book of the princess bride yeah actually yes all right cool I, I... so <laughs> you know if you've never read the book the princess bride and you intend to which i I highly recommend it. I can't speak for Seijin, so I'll let him speak for himself. Oh no, so good. Yeah, no, no, no. It's 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 definitely a fantastic like fantasy story for like when you're. 
I read it when I was probably about 16, too, because that was when Princess Bride kind of like came back into everybody's mind for a hot second. Like, I, don't, I don't know why it like resurged for a while there. Maybe it was like an anniversary or something. Um, but it was fantastic. I loved it. Right. So it's this great book. And if you ever want to read it, stop listening right now until you hear me say the word mackerel again. <laughs> Skip forward until I say that word that I just said a second time. Because I don't want to ruin the fun that that book is. But if you don't care, because we live in 2018, who reads anymore? <laughs> um, here's the real poop on the novelization of Princess Bride. Um, it is written by William Goldstein, who is fucking the best. Like, <laughs> they, there's no other way. He is one of my favorite authors. Um, and it's also because he's related very heavily to the film industry. Uh, Marathon Man is him. He wrote the script for the princess bride. Um, and this book that he wrote, it's, it, it has a lot of author interstitials because he has made this whole fictional story about as he was a kid, his father would read him this book whenever he was sick, which is where you get the grandfather reading the Fred Savage for the movie. Right. And then years later he tracked it down because he wanted to do like a film of it. And he found out that the book that his father read was this 3,000-page tome that was awful. Like, the, the imagine the worst parts about the Lord of the Rings trilogy amplified a thousandfold. The thousand endings and all the walking, and that's it. That's and, it. Like, that's it. That's it. They, they, and, they, and he jokes about how this is an abridged version of that book because he wants people to uh, explain it, and he will come in with these interstitials to let you know what you're missing. And the one that has always stuck with me, that will always stick with me, is the thing of, like, and now there were 200 pages going through her wardrobe picking out what she would and would not bring with her. <laughs> um, and the reason that sticks with me is 16, right? That's when you read The Princess Bride. Right. If, you know, in the post-Princess Bride film era, right? I don't know when you read it beforehand. <laughs> yeah. I don't know the age for it then. Um, but there were people in my high school who talked about wanting to read the unabridged version <laughs> of The Princess Bride. <laughs> and I'm like, no, there is no unabridged version. You guys, you we, guys. We, that's that's the joke. That's the satire. That's <laughs> that's this. He's satirizing a thousand fake endings and nothing but walking. <laughs> oh my god, that's so good though. That you should have just handed them token and just been like, "This is it." I, <laughs> like, <laughs> well, that's the reason why. I mean, I've read the Sil I've read the I've read the Silmarillion. I'm sure I could read this book unabridged. And I'm just like, I hate everybody. Like, th like, that was one of my first moments where I'm like, wow, even the smartest people, huh? Yeah. Yeah, well, I irony, look, look, we live in, a, in an age in which text is more what, how we communicate with each other than speech, right? And one of the things that we have lost over the last 10 years, 20 years, has been irony. And, like, kids don't learn it anymore. You know what I mean? So maybe you were just in the early stages of that. Like, oh, like yeah. it's also the fact that no, 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 no. The kid, the person was not being ironic. He was being 100% No, no, no. Sincere. Not that he was being ironic. Oh, okay. That the book being ironic about like, gotcha. this whole thing. Oh, I just wanted to make sure. I mean, it could go both ways talking about irony. Yes. The big fucking culprit regarding the death of irony is Alanis Morissette. And I love her. <laughs> but that song, none of that shit's ironic. A lot of that shit's coincidental. I think isn't isn't that the joke that it's ironic that she doesn't name anything that's ironic that she calls ironic. <laughs> I think that you're giving Alanis Morissette way more credit. Hey than man, I don't know. She's a smart lady. <laughs> she, I mean, she's written some great songs. I just think that, but okay. But here's the thing: if that was her intention, right? Yeah. If yeah, her yeah, thesis yeah. statement when she sat down to write ironic was, I'm going to name a bunch of stuff that's not really ironic. What an ironic thing to do. <laughs> Fail. Because people, <laughs> like real people in the world, look at that song as their basis for the definition of irony. Yeah, well, she didn't account for people being idiots or just didn't care. <laughs> Isn't that the greatest trick Alanis ever played? But was, I think that that's the real trouble with irony, right? No, sorry, you have to finish that dumb joke you were about to. Go ahead. <laughs> nope, no, 
it's fun. I didn't have an end, so you okay. kind of bailed me um, out. She, uh, no, but I, I think that that's one of the big things, right? Like you see this all the time: people making jokes on Twitter, and and it, people I don't even pe- people who are just like, I was just trying to be ironic. I was just trying to be funny, and I, I like, I know that if it's somebody that. I don't like, I'm automatically like, you're an idiot. You should have realized that wasn't going to be caught on. But if it's somebody that I'm like into, like if Dan Harmon gets on and does something really stupid and then has to apologize for it days later, I'm the first person to apologize for him and just be like, oh, he was just trying to make a laugh. He was just trying to make a fun fun <laughs> and it just didn't work out for him. But like, I think that's one of the things that, that this is what I'm talking about is I think we've, we've completely lost our sense of how to tell when somebody is being satirical or ironic. And we've also kind of lost now the ability to actually have that sense because of that so like we've just we, we're just messed up all around now irony just doesn't work anymore we are we are post ironic because we none of us can get it everybody basically just has to start just saying what they mean because we're all about to kill each other for stupid reasons yeah i mean <laughs> that 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 whole irony thing and alanis morris that it really came into focus for me in 2003 when Ben Affleck wrote, it's ironic, but in the way Alanis Morissette uses that word. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my God, he's so, like, you have to do that. Like, the uh-huh. fact that literally in the dictionary, one of its <laughs> definitions is figuratively. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, man. Um, we should also mention that they're changing the name of Deadpool. That's the other thing. It's it's Deadpool two, by the way. Did we mention that it's, it's actually you, not it's the Deadpool two? Yeah. yeah, we Deadpool didn't say 2. that part, but yeah, yeah, it's PG. So they're gonna do a PG thirteen edit. Disney is behind it. Um, they uh they are like that's one of the big things about this is that everybody's kind of looking at this as like the first dip of trying to see if Deadpool can be Disney friendly now that Fox is gonna be like under Disney's umbrella, and so this is part of this is trying to impress the big wigs there. Um. And so, like, that's kind of an interesting thing. And, yeah, they've renamed it to Once Upon a Deadpool. Um, Perfect. And I'm and very I, and excited. And I'm all about that. And Because what I was tr- saying is, when you've read The Princess Bride, and you've gotten to see all of the, like, st- the stuff edited out in, in like, William Goldstein's interstitials, hmm. I hope that the stuff that's edited out for Once Upon a Deadpool, like, that's when we cut to him and Fred Savage. I mean, that's what makes sense, so right? Like that, and that's the way, because that's how you pull that off. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, wait, before we go time, any further, are we going to say the, anything else about the book of the Princess Bride? No. Why? Do you Mackerel. have one more thought on it? <laughs> oh, there we go. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, yeah, nobody was listening to all I just our wanted stuff. to make sure that we um, let those people come man, back you in. you guys missed the best bits. Like, oh, it was oh, so yeah. funny. <laughs> Oh, Go read yeah. that book and then listen to these last 10 seconds, though, 10 minutes. Don't you love it? A podcast that gives you homework. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, man, I, we, we, we were talking about, so Once Upon a Deadpool, um, oh, yeah, the runtime, that's where I was at. Um, yeah, uh, the runtime on it is apparently pretty close to original runtime. It's only about three minutes under. Um, but if you consider what they would cut out and then refilm and put back in with the Fred Savage stuff, it, it could very easily be a lot of that. I, I'll be very interested to see where the cuts are myself. You know what else? I think that movie, you know how I feel about Deadpool 2 if you listen to mm-hmm. the Sarah for it. Sure. I think that that movie could really benefit from another, from a re-edit. Yeah. I feel like that could that could really help that film out. So, <laughs> it feels like I, the kind of project that will be really cool to watch, having seen the R-rated one. But also, if you're not somebody that has seen the R-rated one yet for any reason, it doesn't seem like a bad version to watch. You know yeah. what I mean? I, and yeah. I think that's going to be the best both worth. My 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 favorite part is that all the fucking baby leg riffing is probably going to be cut out. It's going to have to be. Yes. Right? <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I'm quite excited about that. My father, you didn't hear this part. This is behind the curtain. Very upset that I did not change a light bulb. I found a light bulb to change before we started recording. He just spit on my light bulb to put in his own light bulb. This is (laughs) behind the scenes bullshit because I am now holding a hot light bulb. (laughs) Because he came over to hand me that light bulb. He ripped out of the, the light socket. Don't, don't, do you want to be on microphone for a second? Oh, thank you. Thank you for a box to put this hot light bulb in. 
This is a three-way bulb. Do you not want this for upstairs in your lamp? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. All right. Good talk. Good talk. Okay, wait. I'm, I'm going to go back to my show now. <laughs> All right. Man, Good special talk. guest star, Daddy Jack. And here we go. I don't know if you heard him, but the one that he used was not three-way. So it's all good now. <sighs> I'm sorry for that, like, real. You know, but this is what you get. You get real. You get sports. You get politics. And sometimes I go off on a fucking rant because he hands me a hot light bulb. <laughs> all right, Devin. Tell me all about Billy Zane. Oh, God. I don't I don't want to talk about Billy Zane in this show. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, because, like, I, I don't want to waste that, like, killer title on this episode. <laughs> Okay, so what we I'll can, talk about, I'll we talk. Can... I, I do. I would like to talk about Rhode Island Comic Con. And first of all, kudos to Seijin because I wanted to talk about Ducktales, but he has successfully got me down to ten minutes left in the show. <laughs> so I, I have a choice to talk about Rhode Island Comic Con or Ducktales. And I'll say that you kept mentioning Rhode Island Comic Con earlier. <laughs> oh no, no, I'm going to go with Rhode Island Comic Con because I, I teased it in the beginning. This is the first time that we've said Ducktales. Woo woo. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, so, Rhode Island Comic Con is a thing that's been going on in Rhode Island for, I want to say, five years. Um, maybe four. It hasn't been going on very long, is, yeah, is yeah, what I will baby. say. It's a baby con. It's a, it's a baby con. And the first year, it was run so horribly, I was happy that I didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I'm like, yeah, no, that's exactly what I, I figured. And here's Devin Decker's look at all Comic-Cons, and then I will do a revision for what Rhode Island Comic-Con is. 50% of every Comic-Con is a flea market with stupid high cost of admission. That is a fair point. I, I, yeah, I was... <laughs> it's not where I thought you were going to go, but it basically is a bunch of shit that happened to fall off the back of a truck at some publisher's place or something yeah. like it's a lot of that sort of stuff and yeah. so the, the the other thing about that is the other 50 percent is so the type of clientele that goes out to comic-con as much as it is people who like love their fandoms and want to have a chance to like celebrate and celebrate with like-minded individuals mm -hmm. a lot of them are there for a deal on stuff as well so it's this convergence of two things that i really have an issue with and I mean, I've been to cons before. Collectors but like, and antiquers. <laughs> yeah. Collectors and antiquers and the type of people who run fucking, like, um, booths at flea markets. Mm -hmm. But even more aggressive and even more, like, unprepared for questions because they are focusing on trying to cover the high cost to be a vendor at this particular flea market. Right. Right? It's crazy. I mean, cons, like, basically print money based on the fact that, like, everybody who comes in, $50 minimum, right, mm -hmm. to come in. And then those vendors, it's like $750 a day yeah, that the they need to pay clear. Yeah, them to be there, yeah. which is insane to me. Um, I mean, like, every I which get way. it. Like, I mean, but... that money, of course, does go to pay for guest stars like Billy Zane and Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, and Meatloaf, yeah. and... I was this close for, to Bam Majira, but here's the thing: oh. if you wanna, if you wanna, like, I, I was like nervous to look at them because I was afraid I'd be charged ten dollars. Shit! If I knew you were gonna be that close to Bam, I would have sent you my copy of Thug Two I just got for the GameCube. I, you know what? I would have, I would have stood in line to get him to sign Thug Two. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's a true statement. But that was a surprise. Like we were just walking through like that room, and it's a huge room. It's where um did you go to Botcon when it was in Providence? The it was the Transformers, not the Transformers one. one. It was in the Transformers 2007. One. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That convention, the room that the whole convention took place in, yeah, for Botcon, that is where um just celebrity pictures, autographs and and like meet and greet cool. all time was. Nice, and then man. there's other rooms where there's stuff going on. Like, it's a big convention. I will give them credit for it being a big convention. But the revision is, breaking it down into thirds, it's a third um, stupid expensive flea market, it's a third this type of clientele, and it is a third poor management. <laughs> because 
just across the board, the management is poor at Rhode Island Comic Con. And I yes. want to say that it is it has gotten better, but I had people who were going to appear at Rhode Island Comic Con who canceled the week before because they still hadn't been contacted. They were still not on the website as appearing there. Like, this is the stuff you need to do if you're trying to get, like, local artists to come out. Yeah, what are they trying to do? Like, hide that shit? Like, do they think it's going to be a big, like, upsell in the last week to suddenly release, like, a, a list of people coming? Like, what's the point in Like, I not? don't know. But, like, they also weren't contacted. Like, Ugh. like it was one of my friends, and I was, like, excited. I'm yep. like, oh, it's going to be, like, a big surprise that I'm there because he knows that I don't go to Rhode Island Comic Con. We've had these discussions. But I got talked into it this year by my friend Lance. Shout out to Lance. Um, cause he sold me on it and he's like, we just go on Sunday. So there's less people. You buy a ticket at the door and, and it was, and this was all great. Right. Like, so yeah. it wasn't something I was looking forward to. It was sort of something I happened to be doing this Sunday. And he's like, yeah, yeah. and even if the convention sucks, we're going to go to Trinity brew house afterwards. We'll go to a bunch of brew breweries in Rhode Island. Cause he's from Connecticut. So he doesn't go to these places. Oh, so like awesome. we had like a good post convention plan as well. Cool. And the fact that we walked into Trinity Brew House and we're the only people there. That's insane. Was crazy. I mean, it was in the basement bar, but still. Basement <laughs> bar, SWAT from 2003 is on the television. We're just <laughs> throwing Fuck back, yes. laughing and having fun with the bartender. And, they, and it was like, you would not know that there is a convention a street over. It was awesome. It was just a great experience. Cool. But, um... So I'm happy that I went. If I were ever to go again, it, I would not buy a ticket in advance. I'd do a ticket at the door. But that's the other thing I was going to say is that on the website, it says tickets on the day of the event are $45. So I get there and I'm asked for $48. So I'm like, whatever, right? It's three more dollars. Let's go for it. But then I go back to the website and it does say tickets day of the event, $45. No asterisk. Yeah. Like, like, cause it's tax, right? Cause tax on $45 in the state of Rhode Island, it'd be 48, 15. Mm. So I was like, Oh, they right, gave me a, yeah. they, they saved me 15 cents. Thank you. Yeah. But like, put like all prices do not include tax. Mm -hmm. So that like, I'm not surprised. So it's like at basic, the moment. like basic marketing mistake. Yeah. Like, like that sort of crap. Yeah. That's just it's like, or just that's... tell me that the ticket is $48. Yeah, man. Like well, and you know, I, it's funny that you mentioned like poor management being the real issue at this one. And the thing is, is that that's kind of what you hear about with all of these things, though, nowadays, though, right? Like, I mean, short of the big guys, like, like the big Comic Cons, and you know, they they do their thing, and you don't hear too much about things going haywire there. But like, what was the big like concert last year that was supposed to be this whole like big get together out on some island somewhere, and then everybody got there and everything was just on fire or something? Like, like you hear like these big events that people are just throwing now because i i don't know because what it they is. print money because yeah, literally I, you get uh, you get paid by the vendors so that they'll be there you get paid by the attendees and you only have to pay out to these celebrities but like i i can't imagine they're paying out that much to the celebrities because first of all all of the celebrities looked miserable i don't want i'm gonna name checker because like i didn't understand it but elizabeth henstridge simmons from agents of shield she yeah. like looked just miserable sitting at her booth and i'm like like do you really need to do this i i guess it's probably like some contractual thing i was gonna say that like, that's more than anything it, more than likely with stuff like yeah. that like with somebody like her who's still working like i mean the last right. season of their show hasn't come out yet she's probably under contract to make appearances right. whereas like somebody like bam margera like this is just how he kind of just makes, makes some scratch money, right from, you know but like, for both of them a uh, picture was forty dollars Mm -hmm. An autograph was $40. So it would be $80 to get a picture with them autographed. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's just like, that's, 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 that's a lot of money to me. Just, and, a, just, just, just a yeah, on top mention. of the fact that I paid $50 to get in here. Oof. Like, just a casual mention that I think uh, I'm pretty sure this Saturday I'm going to get to go meet Jerry Duggan for free and have him sign five issues of Deadpool for nothing. Dude, like, or like all of the all of the times that I went to like signings with the Ninja Turtle guys that were completely free. Did, did and we the pay hope to see was Kevin that, Smith? What? We no, Kevin Smith Kevin was Smith. completely free. 
Right. Yeah, yeah. And we we end up, and that's and that's what it is. I mean, that's a signing at a comic book store. So the comic book store agrees to have these people in, hoping that this long line of people will move merchandise. Right. I yeah. mean, because that's that's what they did at Shellback. All those times that Peter Laird and Kevin Eastman were there, they're like, while well, all these people are standing around, they're going to buy our merchandise, and they did. Right. Nobody left there without anything. So. Like, it's just this weird thing where, like, because it's a comic convention, and it, it's just, like, a weird sort of thing that I noticed. But the side quest that I completed is um, two years ago, or maybe just a year and a half ago, they had HasCon, which replaced BotCon and the G.I. Joe oh, okay. Con that Hasbro right. would have every year. Right. They're like, we're just going to celebrate all of Hasbro's things instead of having unique conventions for them. And I did not want to pay money to go to that. But I did want the the twenty dollar RC set that I believe was thirty five dollars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So a friend of mine let me borrow her badge. I will not use her name. I don't think she can get in trouble for it. Um. Because they checked the badge, and if she had bought something, it would be stamped. She didn't buy that. She's like, I'm leaving. I, I I've already left. But if you want to grab my badge, you should be able to get in and buy what you want. So I did that, but I, she's like, I just need my badge back. And I haven't had a chance to see her, but she was working at Rhode Island Comic Con, so I threw it in my pocket, and I'm like, I'm sure I'll run into her, right? That's my goal. First person I saw at the convention, nice. I handed off to her, and I'm like, oh, side quest complete. Like, yeah, there but you also go. kind of left me like empty for like, <laughs> well, that's good. What's no, man, do? it levels you up for the rest of the day. That's, that's true. I was leveled. I also got on Rhode Island Comic Con. Like, I'm probably not going to be in the video, but um, one of the other guys I went with, Jake. Uh, we stopped at a Cumberland Farms beforehand to get like snacks and stuff, and he bought a gallon of water. And they're like, everybody's like, you're not going to be able to bring that in. You're not going to be able to bring that in. So I'm like, so here's what you say. You say it's part of your costume. And you go to <laughs> weapons check and you treat it like any other weapon that people bring in for their cosplay. And he's like, well, who am I? And I'm like, you're the guy with a gallon of water. Short-lived <laughs> sidekick of the Punisher. That's what I said in the car. Right? Like, it is like totally is just like a throwaway thing. So then we're standing in line waiting to get in and Rhode Island Comic Con TV came by and they're like, oh, you know, you're going to have to finish that before you get in there. Not that that's a challenge. And this guy, oh, it reminded me so much of college when I would tell people an answer to say to somebody if they gave us crap and, and I would hear my words come from them. It must be how playwriters feel. <laughs> it, I, like, it must be how Arthur Miller felt every day of his life. Uh, I like that you basically just, you know, just implicated yourself as like the devil in everybody's ear. But yeah, dude, I um, don't give a. No, sometimes it was angelic. <laughs> this is a pretty angelic usage of my my power. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be honest. And he goes, actually, it's part of my costume. And they go, oh, oh, what's your costume supposed to be? He goes, I'm the guy with a gallon of water. And they're like, oh, and who is that? And he goes, uh, you should talk to him. You should talk to him. So, so they come over with like a camera, and I have a microphone in my face. Like, I mean, I've been in that situation before, you know, Da, da Vinci Code. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I so don't know I, if we ever got. But well, that TV might be that, that might be a fun one. Um, and so I have this microphone, and I'm like, yeah. So the guy with the gallon of water, he was a early Punisher sidekick character because dehydration is the biggest challenge facing someone who is punishing the criminal element of New York. So Frank <laughs> Castle hired the guy with the gallon of water to like keep up with him. And if he ever needed the drink, he would be there to hand him that gallon of water so he could take a swig and just keep right on punishing. Oh my God. I and don't know I who's just the bigger idiot in the story. Went you or the people listening and to you. went for like five minutes on this fictional character biography. And then afterwards, after they leave, I'm like, so that was fun. But I said he was introduced in 1974 and the Punisher was introduced in 1982. But I was just in such a zone <laughs> that I said the first year that came to my head. Oh, God. Uh, so They'll never was, check. Nobody They'll never check, today. right? Like, and I, so I hope that's out there. I doubt it is. Um, Meatloaf was there, uh, but the line to see him was super long. So I sang as Meatloaf, I would do anything for entertainment, but stand in that line. I hope you heard me. 
<laughs> uh, if, if this, no verification on that. If there were, th- um, if this were a TV movie, it'd be a Cinderella story where Meatloaf heard a voice similar to his, and now like he takes to like social media and be like, "I need to find the person who sounded like me at Rhode Island Comic Con." Is that what you're hoping for here? Is that he does like a missed connections with you on Craigslist? <laughs> well, that doesn't exist anymore because they've updated their terms of service. But no, like it would be like a, it'd just be. I I could see like that being a stupid movie. <laughs> You, voice in the crowd, me, <laughs> Grammy award-winning artist. <laughs> I would do anything to meet you in person. I would do anything. You took the words right out of my mouth. Oh, God. I heard you. I loved you. And unfortunately here, two out of three is not enough. I need to meet you. <laughs> we need to end this show. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm getting super punchy. But you had me talking about politics. So, yeah, so Rhode Island Comic Con was a good time. Uh, we had we had, I ended up having a good time with it, so I'm very happy that I I eventually tried it out. I'm trying to think if there's any other thing. Oh, Tom Felton. Do you know who Tom Felton is? Yes. Okay. Wait. I want to save it because also I got we were just standing around and a girl came up to us. She's like, "Are you in line for this panel?" And we're like, "What's the panel?" And she goes, "Oh, it's the Voices of Batman the Animated Series." So Kevin Conroy, Tara Strong, and John DiMaggio. So we're like, yeah, yeah, we're here for that panel. <laughs> yeah, we are, goes, there, we are down for that right, panel. All right, cool. This is the end of the line now. <laughs> so we were the last three people to get into this panel that had, like, it, it. there was a cost, right? Like, we were just, like, overflow general admission. We got to go into this panel and hear Kevin Conroy talk about creating the character of Batman for the animated series back in 93. Ooh, Jesus. Yeah, dude, yeah, no, it was super cool. It. But, like, <laughs> the... First of all, there was a cool moment where John DiMaggio, John DiMaggio basically not a part of that show. Like, he did a couple of, like, thugs, but he really got involved with it when he did the Joker in Under the Red Hood. Right. And he's like, so, like, everybody was mad because I'm not Mark Hamill, but I, but then I clapped, right? But, like, not for that, but the fact that I love him in Under the Red Hood. Oh, we, I, his I, Joker I is about so good. On here. Yeah, no, it's, he's... Oh, it's so it, good. It, he's an animal. Like yeah, his it, version of the Joker is just straight up animalistic in a way that that Mark Hamill's never was. And that's one of the things. And then like Kevin Conroy got to talking about like, yeah, like I'm never upset when someone else does Batman because that's what theater was built to do. It was built to allow other people to play the role. So it's exciting to see other people do these characters. So yeah. like that was such a cool moment. I'm not gonna. That was, and we just like sort of stumbled into this event. But it also happened to be a Q and A, and this is going to relate to Tom Felton. So you know we, we'll, we'll be good. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> we sit there, and the, the Q and A line goes. Fifth person in line goes. Uh, could I ask you to do a scene where Batman is fighting with Twilight and Bender is looking on? And the entire crowd groaned. (laughs) Because, like, that is not a question. That is a request. I've got, like, oh, my God. That is not. (laughs) Oh, my awkward empathy is is in, like, high gear right now. Oh, God. And and, I would have left. I would have gotten up and I would have been like, I'm I'm sorry to all of you and just left the room. I'm so happy I didn't. Because John DiMaggio goes... Uh, I think you can judge by the reaction from the room whether or not that's going to happen. <laughs> and he's like, but what'd you say? You wanted uh, Batman fighting Twilight and uh, Bender's watching? Okay. So he goes into Bender voice and he's like, oh, I'm Bender. Hey, look, it's Batman fighting Twilight Princess. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> There's your scene. <laughs> Oh, it was just so Classy. good. It was so fun. It, like, That's and, and that was and that was just like it happened. So then we come to Tom Felton, and it is we have been at Trinity Brewhouse. I, uh, I I could use a a nice forty five minute panel to sit down, and you know get ready to drive home is how I'm right. going to say that. Yeah. So we're walking back to the car. And the guy, and we'd seen this guy, like, around the floor. Like, he's just one of the volunteers. And he's like, hey, you guys want to see Tom? And, well, and, <laughs> and one of the people with us goes, who's Tom? 
And the other one goes, from Stranger Things. And I go, no, Tom Felton, right? So Draco Malfoy. You know, and, from the Potters and, and the Flashes. And, and, he goes, <laughs> and the guy goes, yeah, yeah, do you guys want to get in? I can get you in. So we sit down, and we're like, really good seats for this panel. And it happens to be another Q&A. And let me tell you what sobers up a person faster than watching Tom Felton talk for 45 minutes. Going up and standing in line to ask Tom Felton a question. Oh, God. <laughs> because I didn't have a question when I got in line. Tom Felton, could you do <laughs> Batman versus Twilight? Versus... <laughs> no, 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 no. So I listen to all these questions that are asked. I'm like the eighth person in line because it's a double microphone setup. Well, real classy. Actually, like real classy. I love a double microphone setup Q&A. I'm going to be that guy. <laughs> Who like celebrates this this method Good of ori orientation? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oration. This me this method of oration. So he's answering questions, and they're all Harry Potter. Now, when I think of Tom Felton, what do you think I think of, Sejan? I know what you think of because you mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to think of something besides the two of those things. I don't know. What are you thinking of? I think of him in Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Nice. Very nice pull. because he's so good in that movie, and mm -hmm. and like to the fact that I didn't even realize it was him until after I saw the film, mm. um, because he's so different from Draco, even though they kind of like borrow from a lot of like a similar area. Yeah, so yeah. I'm like, okay, so so I get up to the, the the QA and I go, hi Tom, um, I got to tell you, the only reason I'm here is your presentation, your 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 performance in Rise of the Planet of the Apes. That is what got me into this Q&A today. So my question is, what's your favorite non-Draco Malfoy performance that you've done? And, like, it kind of took him by surprise. <laughs> because everybody probably only knows him as Draco Malfoy. Yeah, or, only, or, or the Julius only people that are going to spend the money the to go Flash. to a Tom Felton panel. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, that is, that's so kind of you to say that. <laughs> and I'm like, and he's like, I gotta say, that's probably the role. Because he had just done this whole thing about how he likes Draco because he's a complicated character. Like, you can see, like, how a lot of his actions are influenced by his parents and what he's supposed to be. He did this whole thing, and he's like, and then I get to do that character who is just despicable. There's no saving him. Nothing about him is redeeming. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I go, well, honestly, that's the reason why I've seen Rise of the Planet of the Apes more times than more than once. It's your performance. So thank you for that. So awesome. then I I walk back to my party and they're like, so we were going to leave after you asked your question. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm good to go. Don't worry. <laughs> after that, after standing in line and being like, I have to be coherent because I'm going to talk to Tom Felton now. <laughs> I'm going to talk to Mr. Tom Felton now. And oh, I have to God. think of a question, because I don't have a question when I get up there. Like, I'm asking him a question. And I'm yeah. like, it needs to be good, right? It needs to be a Devin Decker question. I want him to remember that someone in the audience asked him a question. <laughs> and then he'll wonder, and he'll go Cinderella story. I'm going in circles. So, thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of The Say Report. Uh, there's a lot of sports and politics. That's not usually your bag. Um, we don't dip into those realms that often. <laughs> mostly because you saw how heated both of them got me. <laughs> are you? Are, are we apologizing? I'm no, 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 no. I, I'm not apologizing at all. But I do want to let people know that a lot of the times it's this other stuff we've been talking about. Comic books and movies and video games. We cover it all. This is literally a show about everything. There is no dark, seedy corner of this world that we think is not worth exploring. So here, here. thank you so much for listening. Um, if you want to yell at me about any of my opinions or <laughs> meatloaf, if you're trying to find me, I can be found on Twitter at Devin D. Decker. And if you want to shoot me any images of your cute Sonics from Soul Calibur that you've created, <laughs> then you can catch me at Siege Rose of the World. All right, so without any further ado, let's send it over to the show's very own Ravenclaw, Will, to take us home. Thank you for listening to the Say Report with your hosts Devin Decker and Seaton Serwick. Please follow the guys on Twitter and Facebook by searching for The Say Report, and you can always subscribe on your podcast channel so this is delivered straight to you and you can enjoy it every week. With apologies to your mother, we'll see you next time.